such a great God and he is such a holy God. Yes. Thank you for being here. It is so good to be home. Yes. Okay, come here. We gotta do the we gotta do the Okay, well I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Okay. Hi, I'm Ruby. And I'm Jim. And, and we're, we're home. home. <laughs> We had a fabulous time. Fa I mean, it was fabulous. Fabulous. And uh, God was so good to us. We stayed healthy. We figured if we didn't get anything, any COVID or any diseases while we were gone in all of the places that we went, then we are very secure that we're not going to get sick again. Because <laughs> we were around people all the time. But it was such a great time. Thank you for allowing us to do that. It was a blessing to our souls. Because my favorite part was that I got to spend 24-7 with the man I love. Amen. That was my favorite thing. I mean, we just... <laughs> we had a great time. Word. <laughs> We had a great time. Thank you for that. Thank you for being here today. Do you know we get to, we get to, like the Bible says, fellowship together, break bread together. We get to do that today. So I want you to hug somebody today. I know you got the COVID thing going on. But you need to hug. Somebody in here needs a hug. And we need to hug each other. Okay, I see, the, I see those hugs going on out there. <laughs> That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. <laughs> okay, oh, well, they're smothering there. Oh, they're getting up now. <laughs> okay, get up and hug somebody. Okay, that was good. I needed that. So, okay, let's sing. Now, I'm, I'm okay, we're good. So, let's stand up and sing. And you know how we get to sing to our Heavenly Father. We get to sing to the one who loves us the most in the whole world. The mostest. The mostest. We get to sing to him and praise him for who he is. So, let's sing. Don't worry about your neighbors. You just sing directly to the Lord and just see how beautiful that's going to be. We're going to sing Worthy of Worship. Page three if you need the book, but the words will be up there. Wow. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all 
54, Great is Thy Faithfulness. saw on the line that the first Sunday that Brother Kyle was here that he almost missed this and y'all caught him and brought him back to say it. So I'm proud of you because this is part of who we are. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. This is my Bible. God's That sounds good. Have a seat if you would. It's good to see all of you. Some of you are sitting here thinking, man, we sure have a lot of visitors today. The majority of those people you think are visitors are people from the first or second service. Yes. This is what it would look like if we met one time on Sunday instead of two. And you can see how full we are and, and we have a lot of folks that still aren't here. So uh, praise the Lord. It's good to, good to see the church gathered. Amen? Yes. Good to see the house full. 
But we do have some visitors, so let's take just a minute to meet them. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, would you just raise your hand? Would you do that? You're visiting for the very first time. Good, 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 good. Here we go. All right, I'm coming to meet you, so just hang on. We're going to start right here. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Brandy. Brandy. Great. You live here in the area? Harmon Creek. That's here in the area. Well, it's good to have you all with us. Amen. How are you, sweetheart? I've got a cup for you. And if you will, take and fill out the little green sheet and get that back to me. Everything else is yours. Every time you drink coffee, think of us, okay? And uh, we'd love to have it. All right, right here. Yes, sir. What's your name? Christian. Christian. That's a great name. Hey. That's right. <laughs> now, if your life equals your name, we're in good shape. Amen? Amen. Christian, God bless you. Good to have you with us. Are you here in the area? Good. 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 Well, we welcome you to be a part of the church. Amen. Great. Good. Let's see. Right back here. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Beatrice. Beatrice. Are you from this area? No, I'm actually originally from New York, but I moved from Bastrop to here recently. Hallelujah. Well, good. But you're here in the area now. Well, great. We're glad you're here. Take that, fill out the little green card for me and get that back to me as you leave or drop it in one of the offering boxes. I share with you where the offering boxes are, not for your sake as much as for the members of the church. (laughs) But those are the boxes that are around the room here and you're welcome. Who else I've got? Who? She's not visited for the first time. Yes. uh Yep, yep, I think so. That's okay. Any other first timers? See, that's what I'm telling you. Y'all don't know half of the people, do you? <laughs> if you don't go to Sunday school, you really don't know them. But uh, this is our church, amen? And we're glad for our visitors being with us. Choir? Welcome to the family. You can feel at home here. There's a lot of love that goes beyond these years. There's nothing like the fellowship of those who love the Lord. So welcome to the family. There's always room for more. Hallelujah. There's always room for more. Great. Have a seat. Good. Amen. Well, let me just give you a couple of quick announcements. First of all, Taylor Joe wanted me to let you know that uh, the preschool is having a uh, mission project for the next couple of weeks. Um, that's right, isn't it? I'm looking for a date. Until December the 15th. And they are collecting things for Rita B. Huff. So these will be for animals. So uh, if you go to the store, pick up a bag of food or something like that. Anything that would be good for these uh, kittens and dogs that Rita B. Huff takes care of. And uh, our children are going to take care of that mission project. She, she shared with me, I thought this was interesting. She said, you know, you have uh, the Christmas store, which we take care of our community. The young people do that. She said, we have our seniors who take care of the crisis closet, who takes care of our community. And uh, we have uh, different things that we do. We have uh, the Operation Christmas Child that we do to help others. And she said, this is something that the kids have decided they want to do, and that's to help the animals in our area. So... Praise the Lord, I thought that was a good thing. So they'll be doing that, so if you can help them out, make sure and bring their goodies over to the preschool room, okay? Uh, After this service, we're going to be having Thanksgiving dinner, amen? I put on my belt that has three extra holes. (laughs) Got my stretchy pants on, you know? Not that I plan to be gluttonous, but I do plan to enjoy a great Thanksgiving meal, amen? And uh, you're all invited. You say, I didn't bring anything. Believe me, we have plenty. You just need to come over and eat with us, okay? And secondly, if you brought something, make sure before you leave you take that with you because we get stuck with a bunch of stuff and we wind up having to throw it away and we don't want to be wasteful. So please, if you bring something, if there's anything left, take it with you, okay? Make sure you do that. Everybody heard that? Amen. Good. And once we get through eating, stick around and help clean up. That's always a good thing to do. But enjoy the family. You know, don't be in a hurry. Take a little time. Visit with people. Sit at different tables. Uh, we'll have, we'll, we're going to we're gonna have more people when we have tables. We always do that. So some of you will have to eat in Sunday school rooms. But listen, enjoy the fellowship. Don't be griping. Amen? Amen. Be griping. Children need to stay with their parents. Don't go through the line without your parents. So make sure you're with your parents 
as you go through the line. And if you don't mind, maybe give a little bit of latitude for some of our seniors. Amen. Come on, guys. Amen. You seniors want to be a little latitude to get in line first? That kind of thing? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a senior yet, so I'm not a minute. Okay. There will be no service tonight. There will be no service Wednesday night. We won't meet again until next Sunday morning, okay? It just inter- Thanksgiving just kind of consumes us around here. Either you're going or you're coming or people are coming. And so we just, over the years, we decided let's just do this. And so that's what we're going to do. You'll have this afternoon as we meet together as our Sunday afternoon kind of opportunity. And then we won't meet again until next Sunday morning, okay? Did y'all see somebody extra in the room today? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Have y'all noticed? Yes. yes. Who is it? It is Betty. Betty? Well, I didn't even see her. <laughs> I walked right past her and she said, Brother Newton, Brother Newton. I oh my gosh. Y'all see Betty's here. Isn't that amazing? Yes. She told me back in the summer, I'm going to be in church on Thanksgiving. I'm planning on being there. And she's got both her prosthetics on. She is walking, but she's still working. So we give her a little patience. Amen. She would love to have walked in here, I know. And, uh, but uh, isn't it great? God is so good. And she has been... And I'm going to tell you something. If you followed her on Facebook, this little gal has grown in her faith like nothing I've ever seen before. Every time I visit with her, it's such a blessing because I hear her talk of her faith that God's going to do this for and how God has blessed her. If you think you're going through a rough time, she's been through it and she came out the other side and God has gifted her with grace and faith. I'm telling you, I'm so proud of you, Betty. Good to have you. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, uh... After this weekend, after this week, of course, then we can begin to celebrate Christmas, right? Did you see that they, I saw a picture, somebody had taken one of those big turkeys you, that they blow up in the yard and had a big blow up Santa Claus and the turkey was on top of Santa Claus with a sign that says, not yet. <laughs> Amen. 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 You better not tell you what, you go to the stores, they don't get through with Halloween before they're putting up Christmas stuff. But um, anyway, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, and we're going to be having a great time. The auditorium will be decorated for Christmas next Sunday, and uh, we're going to move right into the Christmas season. But we're not there yet. We're going to do Thanksgiving today, all right? I am going to preach a Christmas message, though, but that's all right. It'll work. It'll work as both. All right, I think that's all I have. I know there's a lot of things going on. Please make sure, take your bulletin and keep up. Uh, I know we have a, a gals. Uh, the, Ruby has a bruncheon for the ladies. Yes. yes. Ladies Christmas Brunch. Um, it will be in the fellowship hall. We will have door prizes. Um, I think there's a sign up sheet for you to let us know so we can kind of have a number of how many to set up for. And if you would like to help with the food, there's a sign up there too to bring food. But it is a time of just, uh, we have a speaker, uh, Betsy, Allie's mama oh, is going to be the speaker. And then Kayla Birchfield is going to do the music for us. So we've got a great program. And last year we had enough door prizes that everybody walked out with the door prizes. We're working on that again this year. So we would love for every lady to come and let us just love on each other and break bread together and sing together because we'll sing Christmas carols. Amen. So we have that coming up. Amen. That's awesome. And also on... I just need to throw this okay, in. Okay, go ahead. Okay, on December the 19th, Sunday morning, we're going to do our Christmas cantata. So Sunday night, we do our children's program. So, children, you need to be thinking about what Christmas song you would love to learn for that program. Because that's this is our 10th year to do the children's program. Yeah. So we That's would awesome. love for all the kids to participate. And it's from babies up until high school. Yeah. So please put that on your calendar to do that. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Also, the Toy Story you'll see in your bulletin. The Toy Story is going to be the 11th. And uh, if you have gently used toys or new ones that you'd like to contribute, please do so. 
and then uh, contact PD or Sonia if you have any questions. So a lot of things are happening, and I know some of the Sunday school classes are having Christmas parties. If you're in one, get involved with it and have fun and uh, be a part of something. Amen? Amen. All right, good. Uh, let's bring the kids down and see what we have in the surprise box this morning. Also, uh, do we have the, uh, the uh, picture of the Operation Christmas Child? Let's put that up there. Yeah, if you would. That would be great. Hey, girls. I don't have any boys. I'm the only boy. I feel very, very lucky, very blessed. Who have you got there, Ellie? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. I believe you. I think he had too much Thanksgiving, huh? Good. Hey, guys, girls. There's one of my buddies. Hey, man. What's your name? Landon. I'm so glad you came up, Landon. Help me. Oh, here comes some more. Here comes another one. Great. Good. Good. Well, I have the surprise blocks this morning, and I have several things in here. Let's see what we got first. I've got two little bracelets. I can't read what they say. Uh, Roaring Back and uh, San Diego Zoo Pass. And I got another one. Oh, it's got a skeleton head on it. That's something I want to wear, huh? Well, that's cool. Oh, but look at this. <gasps> Ooh, it's a shell, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? You can do what? Huh? I hear the ocean. And there's somebody surfing. <laughs> you believe that? Have you ever heard the ocean? Isn't that the coolest thing? Isn't that beautiful though? Isn't that, you, know, you know, I can't help but think about God when I see this. God made this little creature. And then to protect it, He made this hard shell to protect it. But then God said, you know, I don't want it to be ugly. I want it to be pretty. And so he made it just like that. So it's beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? God made that just for that animal to protect him. Isn't God good? Yes. God always likes to protect. Did you know the Bible talks about that there's angels that protect our children? You have a, what we call a guardian angel that's with you all the time. You may not even know it because you don't need to know it. God put him there. It's not somebody you need to pray to or talk to. It's somebody that God, uh, angel that God gave to watch over you because God loves you. And I think that's the most awesome thing in the world. God does love us, doesn't he? And he loves to protect us. He loves to take care of us. If we'll listen and do what he says, it makes his job easy. So we need to do that so we can be protected. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll head off to Children's Church. I see old Santa there. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you do protect us. You love us so much that you send angels to go around us and protect us in times, Father, when we might be in danger. And thank you, Lord, for these little ones that, God, you have protected and brought them, Father, to this place so they can hear the Bible, they can hear the Word of God. And thank you, Lord, you've protected them so that they can come to the place of knowledge and understand who you are. And that you love them so much that you sent Jesus to die for them. And thank you, God, that you protected them so that they can have a chance to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, if today something is said, maybe, maybe that something will be said that will help them to come to understand their need for a Savior and they'll be saved. And for those that are saved, Lord, I pray today will be a great day as they love you and serve you in everything they do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, who needs the box? Who needs the box? Oh, you always raise your hand. You always raise your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Do you need the, you had the box just recently, didn't he? Yeah, I thought he did. Okay. Have you had the box lately? You did? Okay. No? First time. Oh, okay. Come here, baby. Come here. This is our surprise box. And I'm fixing to ask. Just wait a minute. They forgot I do know how to do this. That's what <laughs> she wants to bring the surprise box next week. Will you be here? That's the way we get visitors to come back. Amen. <laughs> What's your name, hon? Raytheon. Say it again. Raytheon. Raytheon? 
Gracie Ann, I got it now. Gracie Ann, all right, Gracie Ann, you take it. Put one thing in there, and you don't tell anybody, and you bring it back to me next Sunday, okay? And we'll open it, and I'll talk about it, okay? okay. Thank you for coming. You're so pretty. All right, we have Children's Church for all the kids back in the back. So kids, let's head back there, and uh, they'll take care of you. Mom and Dad, let them go. And uh, by the way, we're going to show this uh, picture up here in just a second. What's he got, a mouth? Well, he sure does. Look at that. Okay, baby, you can go take it with you. You keep it with you all week and put something in there. You can give it to your mom if you want to. Okay. There's your mom back there. <laughs> mom, you're confusing me. All right, let's, uh, we have some pictures of the Operation Christmas Child. Did y'all realize that we gave... We, we, our church, this year gave the mo most boxes we've ever done before. 622 Operation Christmas Child boxes are going out. Those boxes... <laughs> this is a picture of them. They took them over to Dorcas Wheels where they gather all of them. And do uh, you realize that 622 families that are going to receive the gospel because you gave and work to help us get that done? 622. We started out in 2012, or I think we started before that, but 2012, first time I think we had a record, we, we gave 60 boxes in 2012. We gave 622 boxes this year. Thank you to uh, Carmen and to Royce for their work in putting that together and for the WEM and Brotherhood and all of you who gave and know that God, one day you'll go to heaven and you'll be walking around heaven and some person's going to walk up to you and say, I just need to tell you thank you. I don't know who you are. I'm the one who received the box you packed. And I was saved because of that. And so was my family. I just want to tell you thank you for giving to the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, brother. Let's stand together. If you're using the hymn book, it's 644. And this is the time when we should really count our blessings. When upon life's pillows you are tempest lost, when you are discouraged and the all is lost, count your many blessings, thank them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, thank them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened? Yeah. 
Probably a lot of you don't know it, so I'm going to give you the words, I'm going to read them to you, you can see them up there. But it's something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, and he made something beautiful of my life. Amen. So, I'm going to, the choir's going to sing it through once, and then I want you to join us on the second time, okay? Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion, he understood, all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion, he understood, all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he
Amen. We get those folks out there, we're really going to be full. Amen. It's awesome. Amen. <laughs> Thanksgiving every Sunday would be all right with me. All right. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I have four Sundays in which to preach the Christmas message. Now, you know, originally you think, well, okay, then we'll preach about pre-birth, birth, after uh, his birth, the, you know, the thing, the thing, the nativity. And that would be great. But as I was thinking and praying about what to preach, I remember a sermon I preached some years ago that I just have to tell you that the sermon was one that just really grabbed my heart. I mean, just literally grabbed my heart, much more than just the nativity story, although I know that's important and I want to do that. But this morning, I want to talk to you about a person of interest. Many of you, I, I'm going to read this and you fill in the blank, okay? Just listen. It came to pass in those days, there went out a decree from... Huh, isn't that interesting? You know his name. Only place in Scripture his name is mentioned, you know that name. Isn't that amazing? Now what do you know about him? He gave a decree. Everybody obeyed him. If you will, take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2, we'll look at verses 1 through 3. And I want to answer that question this morning. I think it's really interesting to understand just who this fellow was. He sure carried a lot of weight. And it was because of him God was able to set up the nativity. And I think we need to know a little bit about him. Not that he's any great Christian, because he wasn't. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Circle that, all and then underline all the world. It's really important there. Not just a group, not just certain ones, all the world to be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, verse 3. And all, circle that again, went to be taxed. Everyone, circle that, into his own city. I just have to ask the question, who is this guy? To have this much authority, this much power, this much say that people will obey what he tells them to do. I think, like the old tabloid used to say, inquisitive minds want to know. So I hope I've set you up for that question, and I hope I can answer that for you in just a few minutes. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity I have to serve a God that's in control of everything. I'm thankful I serve the God, my Lord, who is master, not of just this world, but of the universe, of everything. I'm glad this morning, Father, I get to call you Father. And no, Father, you're the creator of everything. And you're the God of us. I pray, Father, today as we look into this text, that we'll get a clear understanding of what an awesome God we serve. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have you stopped to consider all the things we don't know and yet are so familiar? See, this is one of those things we don't know, and yet every one of you just about knew who this person was. Who was it that sent the, the decree out to be taxed? Caesar Augustus. We know that. But what do we know about him? Little or nothing. And to be honest with you, the Bible has little or nothing to say about him either. So to begin this morning, I'm going to be giving you a history lesson. Now, don't get, some of you going, oh goodness, a history at church. Wow, that would be great. I promise you before it's over, you're going to be going, oh my goodness. I can't believe what I just heard. Not because it's great from my point of view. It's just awesome to think that God, your God, my God, my Father, 
is sovereign. He is over all. Nothing happens that he's not in control of. Nothing. Boy, we need to realize that. Some of you are going through some tough times and you're wondering, where is God in all this? I tell you this, he's right there. He promised he'd go with you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's with you, amen. He says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can trust he's there. So as I began to think about what I was going to preach, I, I, got, I got kind of hung up with this one verse because I kept wanting to ask the question, who is this guy? And who gave him so much authority that he could give a decree and everybody did what he said. Let me give you some history about this fella. He was born Gaius Octavius Thurinus. That was his original name. That was his given name. His father claimed to be a descendant of Alexander the Great. Now, you may think that's a wonderful thing, but wait a minute. He's a Roman. And Alexander the Great was a Greek. A Grecian. So if his father was going around saying, I just want you to know that my, my father was uh, 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 Alexander the Great, he was not winning any big points with the Romans, amen? Because the Romans had to defeat the Grecians in order to take over. So let me just say this about his father. His father didn't carry much weight. But listen who his mother is. His mother was the niece of Julius Caesar. You say, how in the world did they get together? I don't know. I haven't read that story yet. But evidently they got together. And so his mother is the niece of Julius Caesar. That makes him the nephew, the great nephew of Julius Caesar. Well, let's go on. His father dies at age four, uh, when he's age four. And his stepfather wanted little to do with him. Just literally didn't care anything about Octavius. So he was raised primarily by his grandmother. Now think about who that is. If his mother is the sister of Julius Caesar, or uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, the niece of Julius Caesar, who would his grandmother be? She would be the sister of Julius Caesar. He was raised by the sister of Julius Caesar. Okay, now look, here's the thing. This is one of those things you're not going to say amen to because it has no, no biblical basis to it. It's just history. If you were saying amen to this, yeah, I'd be going, wait a minute. What are you, what are you reading? You know? uh, so I understand that. But as I go along, you're going to understand my excitement. I think. I hope you will. Because this is pretty cool stuff when you get it all together. I'm not through yet. So he's raised by the sister of Julius Caesar. Through a series of events, he wins the favor of his great uncle. And uh, when he demonstrates great valor in a military campaign. Julius Caesar had no living heirs. So he names Augustus, or I mean he names um, Octavius as his sole beneficiary in his last will and testament. But it's not read, and Octavius doesn't know this until after Caesar's assassination. But whenever the will is read, Octavius finds out about this and claims his political inheritance as well as heir of two-thirds of Caesar's estate. This little guy who was worthless to his stepfather, who uh, by and large was just a little named, unnamed fellow out here, has now moved into a position of great authority and great wealth. Pretty awesome when you think about it, but he's not through. Because this power begins to take hold of this young man, and he likes it. And so as he continues on, it's not long after that that he joins forces with Mark Anthony, you know who that is, and Marcus Lapidus. These were two uh, military uh, leaders, and he forms an alliance with them, forming a military dictatorship that, that literally killed or put down the Senate of Rome. If y'all have ever studied about Rome, this, there was always this battle between the Caesars and the Senate running the show. Well, when Julius Caesar dies, the Senate says, okay, now that we can run it, well, he's going to squelch that by joining forces with these two military leaders. In just 12 years, Octavius had overtaken the other two rulers and now was the sole ruler of all of Rome. That was his obvious plan from the very beginning. He was a master manipulator. He saw the opportunity to be this power magnet, this, this man who controlled the world. You know, you 
those of you that watch uh, these uh, superheroes, they're always battling the one who wants to be the master of the universe. Well, this is what he wants. And he sees his opportunity as over 12 years, things just keep happening and things keep dumping in his lap. And more and more, he begins to move towards that idea. If I get rid of these guys, then I'm the sole guy. I'm going to be the one in charge. In just 12 years, he moved to that place of being the ruler the sole ruler of Rome. During his rule that lasted until 14 AD, he reigned as the most powerful man in the known world for 45 years. He reigned as the most powerful man, each year becoming more and more comfortable with his final title, title which was Patar Patria, which means father of the country. And if you realize the country was what was known as the world, Rome was known as the world. If you saw, you, you think of Rome as this little area. Rome literally consumed most of the Mediterranean, all the countries around the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, it was huge. He controlled that. So he was father of the country, but he liked the idea he was father of the world. He liked that title. In fact, he liked a lot of his titles. He found that the more titles he had, the more authority he had. So he began to add to his titles. You might say he was a self-made man because he kept giving himself these titles. At the time of Julius Caesar's death, Octavius, I'm sorry, at the time of Octavius' death, he had become known as, get this, and you have this in your notes, Imperator Caesar Diva Filius Augustus Patar Patria Pontifax Maximus. Woo! What titles, amen? Man, I tell you what, this guy had some clout. He had some titles. You know, people love titles. So, especially people of power love titles. I want to be the CEO of the company. I want to be the president of the company. In churches, I've run into pastors. They are strung up with their ideas of their, their titles. I, I had a preacher one time and I called to visit with him and his secretary, I said, can I speak to, and I used his first name, and she quickly told me, his name is Dr. So-and-so. I said, oh, excuse me, I didn't realize. And she told me real quick, he's always referred to as brother or doctor. Don't ever refer to him, just his first name. Huh. You know, I was born with my, my single name and I like it, I like to hear it. You know, it doesn't bother me. Somebody calls me Jim. You call me Brother Newton, fine. But I don't mind being called Jim. Some people think it's, um, well, it's just a title. Amen? Amen? Who I am is who I am. I'm like Popeye. Amen? I am who I am. That's who I am. But he, uh, Octavius now has become this <laughs> super duper mm, pontiff or... I don't know what you'd call him. Caesar. Octavius soon realizing after his inheritance, he needed to get rid of his own name, so he took the name of Julius Caesar. Gaius Julius Caesar. His father being a great man could not weigh up to the potential of the great Julius Caesar, and so he became Gaius Julius Caesar. I'm going to go through this list of names. I want you to hear who he says he was. Two years after his death, the Senate voted that Julius Caesar as Divus Ilias, which means divine Julius, raising his status to that of God. Julius Caesar, he dies. They said, you know what? He was such a great man. Let's make him a god. And so they call him Divas Ulius. Well, Octavius later comes along and decides, you know what? If he's Divas Ulius, I'm Divas Filius. I'm the son of God. Huh, Interesting. That was part of his name to promote himself politically and religiously. In January of 27 B.C., the Senate gave Octavius the new title of Augustus from the Latin word meaning the illustrious one, a title of religious rather than political authority. And according to Roman religious beliefs, the title symbolized a stamp of authority over humanity and in fact over nature. 
You know what? If somebody is over humanity and over nature, he's God. So Octavius loved the name Augustus because it put him on that position of being a God. Octavius. Augustus. He also styled himself as Imperator Caesar Divafilius, meaning Commander Caesar, son of the Deified One. Deified One. Imperator means victorious commander. So as he uses that term, I want you to hear what he's saying. He's saying to you, he says, look, you need to understand, I'm always the winner. I'm Imperatus. I'm always the victor. You're always the loser. So keep yourself in that position because I am above everybody. That's what he's saying, Imperatus. He really thinks a lot of himself, don't you think? On March the 12th, or March 6th, 12 BC, he additionally took up the position of Pontifax Maximus. Now this was the final thing. Everything else showed that he was politically over everybody, but now he needed to be over religion as well. Pontifax Maximus is the fact that he became the high priest of all religion. He thinks himself pretty important. His authority had reached the whole world. He truly was, by his own titles, the boss of the whole world. So if you were to say to this man, you're not the boss of me, he would simply give you his name and titles. Don't tell me I'm not your boss. I am Imperator Caesar Diva Filius Augustus Pater Patria Pontifex Maximus. Did I leave anything out? And of course you would say no. And listen to this. Can I put that into English terms? Listen to what he says. I am Commander in Chief Caesar, the Son of God above all others, the Father of the world and High Priest of all religions. Who says I'm not their boss? He really thought he was. And by everybody's bowing down to his every wish, he truly was somebody that was boss of the whole world, it seems. So when it came time for the tax and the census, it was nothing for him to call upon the whole world to obey him. Luke tells us, and it came to pass in those days that there went out this decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And they all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Caesar gave the order. People did what they were told. Caesar was the boss of the whole world. You don't find people basically complaining. You know, if today we, we Americans, I guarantee you, you talk about taxes and we get our, we get our old backs bowed up, don't we? You're not going to tax me. You tax somebody else, don't be taxing me. You know, we, we're not going to let that happen. If somebody came out and says, I want the whole world to be taxed, I know Americans would go, hold on, buddy. You, you've got another thing coming. You may tell the other part of the world that, but you're not telling us. We're Americans, amen? And we'd stand up to them. That's who we are. But at this time, this man had this kind of power, this kind of authority. So who's the boss of Caesar? Who's the boss of Caesar? Let me give you the truth to this whole thing. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. I want you to turn there. You need to see. I've got two passages of Scripture I'm going to have you turn to. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Paul gives Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 for us in a language that, better under, that helps us better understand what took place here. You see, in Luke chapter 2, we read, and it came to pass. It's almost kind of flippant. That just happened. Paul said, no, it didn't just happen. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come. You see, Paul's saying the same thing, but putting the emphasis where it belongs. It came to pass in those days. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons. There's something major happening here. This thing that we read in Luke chapter 2 about Caesar Augustus is something that God had planned out. This is something that by God's plan and design was being played out exactly the way God wanted it to. This man was all these things he said he was, 
only for the reason that God wanted to use them to accomplish what He wanted to do. Did you hear what I just said? Now how's an amen? It has an amen. God allowed Octavius to become this man that had so much control for one simple reason. God had a plan that He needed him in that position to accomplish. Oh, Octavius, he thought he was something. I'm all this and no more. You don't tell me what to do. And God just smiles and says, yeah, watch and see. You're going to do just what I tell you to do. And he taxed the whole world and they came. Now look, you say, how do you know that? Well, first of all, Galatians chapter 4 tells me that. It tells me when the fullness of time was come. When God decided it was time. The great timekeeper, amen? There's nothing that happens in your life that God doesn't know about and there's nothing that happens in your life that's out of control. He knows exactly when it's supposed to happen, how it's supposed to happen, and He knows the outcome of that. I know that we face some terrible things and we wonder about them. We question them. I got word from my daughter this morning. Her father-in-law is in the hospital, been in the hospital with COVID. Okay. And uh, she got word this morning that he wasn't going to make it. And the family was called in and Ruby just said that he's passed. We've been praying for him. And many people say, well, you've been praying for him. Didn't God hear your prayers? Oh, yeah, he heard our prayers. What greater healing could a man receive, a Christian man, than receive the complete healing of being able to go into the presence of God never to suffer again? Amen. But see, we don't view it that way. The Bible says in Psalms, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I use this in, in, in messages at, at funerals many times. We view it as the worst thing that could ever happen, that we die. No, it's not. Paul says that we not mourn as others who have no hope. You see, we have hope. We know that there's a heaven. We know there's, there's a place that's preserved for those who've given their heart and lives to Christ. Rod was a believer. This morning, he stepped out of a body that was decaying and dying and moved into a place where there is no such thing as death or dying. Sure, I mourn the loss as the family does. But we need to see it the way God does. God, there's nothing outside God's control. We have it in our head that somewhere along the line something happens and, and we go, God, did you know something? And God says, really? Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. God never does that. You'll never ever hear God say, oops. He doesn't say that. God's in control. If He can take somebody like Octavius, raise him to a position where he can declare a tax that forces everyone to move to a different location, just so, and get this, the reason he needed him there in that position to make that happen is because remember Mary and Joseph? Where were they? Nazareth. If you look on your map, your Bible makes you'll see Nazareth is way north in Judea. They were to be in Bethlehem, according to the Old Testament. There's a prophecy that Bethlehem would be the place of the birth. They've got to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And God says, now then, I'm fixing to move you. Now, if I were Mary, I'd be going, uh, Lord, you realize this is the ninth month. That's a long ride. I don't think my doctor will approve of that. God says, you're going to go. And they did. Just as God had planned. You say, why? Why didn't God just let her get pregnant in Bethlehem? You know why? Because of this message. God wanted to show you that there's nobody above Him. That God can make anything happen that He wants to happen. Sure, He could have had them down in Bethlehem. They could have been born there, raised there. And she could have got pregnant. But that wasn't what God wanted because God wanted to demonstrate to us His power and ability to move people, to do things that need to be done to accomplish what He wanted done. What an amazing thing. All of these men who thought they were something. When I think of Caesar Augustus, when I think of Pilate or Caesar, 
When I think of all these who were used in God's plan to bring about the plan He had previously decided. Do you know when God decided that Jesus would die for your sins? He did that before you were ever created. Before man was ever created, God did that. Jesus is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. It was already decided that He was going to do that for you. If you're saved this morning, you know why you're saved? Because God directed your path to a place where you heard the gospel and then you responded to the gospel and you got saved. God did that. Oh, you made the choice. But understand this, your choice was used by God to accomplish His will. That's powerful. What a powerful God we serve. Many if not all, suffer from the same delusion that Caesar did. Caesar said, I'm the boss. You don't tell me what to do. You know, I would want to condemn Caesar for being like that, except every morning I look in a mirror that somebody that does that too. How many times do I tell God, I'm the boss? God, don't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. You say, I would never say that. You do it every time you say no to God. You said, I'm going to be the boss. Caesar, Caesar didn't know, but whatever power he thought he had, it came from God. I have another passage I want you to... You need to have this underlined in your Bible. It's in 1 Chronicles, the Old Testament. I think it's like this is probably 6th, 7th, 8th book. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 29... Verses 11 and 12, you really need to have this one marked. This is so vital to understand. Listen to this. 1 Chronicles 29 and 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. <laughs> You're not the boss of me. Oh, yes, I am. I created you. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for the things that are going on in your life. I'm, I'm working out some details in your life. You may not understand it, but it's okay because you need to trust me as your God. I'm in control. I'm above all. Verse 12, Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Augustus Caesar had no power except what God gave him. Was he a Christian? No. Was he a believer? No. His God was some heathen gods. Multiple gods. But God gave him that power. That's where he got it. You can never take credit for being a self-made man or woman. Can't do it. You just can't do it. You don't get to be who you are by yourself. It's God who does it. We need to stop thinking we're something and remember we're nothing except what God makes us to be. And then celebrate that. Celebrate that. We also need to recognize those in position of authority over us have been placed there by God. We live in a time and an age when we criticize the authority figures. I understand that. They're not doing what we think they should. And we agree, they're not. But do you know that they're in that position of power because God put them there? I don't like that. It's fine. Do you want to be boss? You want God to be boss. Amen? We need to learn to accept God's will in things. It doesn't mean that we don't stand up. It doesn't mean we don't stand up for what's right. We do. But it means understand in the end, God calls the shot. He's the one that makes it happen. In your life, He's the one that makes it happen. This morning, if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
You know the reason you don't? It's probably not because you hadn't heard it. It's because you think you're the boss. I don't need what God has to offer in salvation because I'm going to make it on my own. Oh, you're the boss now. It's not going to work out very well for you because God's the boss. And God calls the shots. And God has determined that we need a Savior. And that Savior is none other than His Son, Jesus Christ. And God hung Him on a cross for you. God the Father did that for you. Because He loves you. And He wanted you to have eternal life. God loves you that much. But He didn't leave Him dead. He didn't leave Him in the grave. He brought Him out of that grave the third day to show you He has victory over death. And you can have victory over death too. By putting your faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, Lord, this morning, forgive us when we want to be boss. Somehow, Father, that old sin nature in us desires to run the show. But God, as we've come to understand from the Word of God, You have so much better plans for us than what we could plan. So, Father, we as Your children, those who are saved, may we this morning recommit ourselves to stop being the boss and let You be boss. And then, Father, if there's someone here that does not know You as their Lord and Savior, if they've been trying their best to do what's right in hopes that in some way they can make it to heaven on their own, I pray today they might recognize that their being the boss is not working. But they need You to be their Savior. And I pray that they might come and receive You as their Lord and Savior this morning. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet right where you are. And as we do, the girls are going to sing and play. And if you will, just stay in a matter of prayer. And if God is speaking your heart about a decision you need to make, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. And I'll be here at the front for you and be glad to pray with you. If there's a special need that you need prayed for, I'd be glad to do that. But if you're here and you're lost, you need to be saved. Don't you leave here without being saved. I'll stay as long as I need to so you can be saved today. Father, I pray right now you'll bless our time of invitation. Use it, Father, for what you want to. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed as the girls sing and play. You do what God wants you to do right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, that you will bless now our time of fellowship. And thank you, Lord, that we serve a God who's bigger than our problems, bigger than us, bigger than the problems of this world, Lord. 
sometimes we watch the news and we get despondent because of all that's going on. But Lord, <laughs> we serve a God who's bigger than all of that. May we with joy face the things you have for us, knowing, God, that you're going to work out all the details. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we just...